Welcome. Many of you have been to SV Nuclear Science before? Ah, a lot of new faces. Welcome. Today we have a um, very interesting series of speakers. Um, it's actually part one of intro to data products, right? And the best way to know about data products is actually see them in action. So we have um, several folks. First, uh, Manish will kick off and introduce what is a data product, how is the anatomy of data product look like. But we have a couple of interesting applications. One that uses uh, Amazon Lambda uh, infrastructure, another one that uses um, and a security application using D3 and uh, backend R and SQLite. We have a shiny application somewhere and a Tomcat app. So a lot of different apps. So part one is look at some of those and see what they are. And part two will be actually do some, right? So we'll actually have a series of these where we can build some data products of course it is um, um, kind of a good hands-on learning experience. Um, how many of you have brought your laptops. Please bring it next time. For part two, without laptops, we will not let you sit. Sorry. Or we can have you purchase one with us. <laughs> Please bring laptops, um, because learning by participating, learning by doing is kind of the way mm -hmm. of the day, right? Otherwise, you can watch this on YouTube at home, right? because this is actually being Recorded, we record it and you can watch it at home. But you're here, so you bring your laptops and ask questions. Um, on the slide here, we are saying there's a bunch of, we are hiring. So those of you who are interested in talking to our team after, please um, talk to Tom. Tom always wears the same clothes. <laughs> <laughs> so you always recognize him wherever you are. Um, simplifies my life. Simplifies his life. It's like uh, like the Steve Jobs mantra. Uh, but Tom's uh, our head of engineering. He's head of uh, our garbage collection team. He, he does everything possible in this company, right? Sort of. So he, you can go ask him. One of the things that we have seen our team do is create rock stars, right? We are we're not just looking for rock stars. We know how to build rock stars. Stars. We're all made of star, right? Stardust. You've heard of that before? Okay. We're all stardust, particles, stars. So we, as a company, we are a very flat company. This is how we live, right? This is where we work. Our community sits here. Our code is made there. Our customers also come here. I recruited my first investor, angel investor, at a meetup, right? So meetups are how we built this company. So we, this is how we build our community, our brand as well. So this is normal. Um, so if you're excited about us, H2O, there's a lot to learn about the company as well. We do a lot of annual conferences. Uh, this is quarterly H2O Worlds, mini worlds. It's a lot of ways to reach out to the community. So you'll see us for sure in the course of, the, we did about 200 meetups. That's Betty. Betty is our head of marketing. Uh, she's also recruiting for marketing. So um, that's probably, a web designer, but there's also real field marketing position she's recruiting for. We're recruiting for data science. Um, it's a lot of, um, we're recruiting for open source contributions. How many of you have used open source? There we go. How many of you have paid for open source? <laughs> That's good, man. Where, where are you from? Which planet are you from? Good. He actually paid, believes in open source support. Good. How many of you have contributed to open source? Nice. We, we want to see all the hands up, right? Because we don't actually, I mean, paying for open source is good, but contributing in open source is far more valuable, right? It is the culture of making, right? Let's make software, not just consume it. Right? Once you make H2O, for example, or make Spark, or make an algorithm, you become part of it. You see a, a change happen. Someone else will give a pull request against your code. Someone is starting using the product. That's how we built H2O, right? So it's a very uh, reinforcing, reinforcing to what you've done. Right? So 
With that, I want to say that there will be a GitHub for this for this uh, big part one, part two, part three series, which will make Tom post for us. So you can actually pull requests against these projects. So then you can actually work them, start adding more your own applications. Uh, some of the applications you'll see today, you can fork them, they're all in Apache V2. So you can actually fork, make them better, change the content, change the data, talk about different stories. So hopefully data products becomes in the next revolution. Right? The first thing we did as a company was make data science very popular. What we want to do over the course of the next three, four years is to make data products very popular. Not just popular, but useful. Right? So that's how we're going to kick off today's meetup. Without further ado, with Manish uh, presenting, and and you'll see some applications today, but they are not going to be hidden. You can take them with you and start changing them and bring them back with more. And hopefully, my goal is by part four, three of the people in the audience will be presenting. Okay, thank you. This might be as long as I was a chore for me in the way. All right. Okay, let's get started. You heard that? Um, all right, so we're going to start with uh, a little bit of um, setup on uh, data products uh, today. So for the next 10-15 uh, minutes, it's going to be a top-down view of our viewpoints on data products, how they fit in, uh, what they look like, and then I'll finish up with a demo of an app, and then you'll see more applications around data products. So. What we believe, the, the first statement, you know, it might sound very business-like, but as we are um, moving around customers, so my role within HTO is uh, customer success, so I see a lot of customers every week, and we go and um, talk to them about uh, developing their own ecosystem of their products. And what we see is that it's actually a sustained business differentiation. What that means is that uh, the best companies out there that have monetized their data to some degree, and monetize is a very business-like term, but what that means is They've taken all their data together and done something with it, be it basically customer segmentation, fraud detection, uh, new product development. If, as long as they've done some investment in product in-house by themselves, they have actually been able to create a differentiation in the market, which is also exemplified by their performance um, on the top line and the bottom line, meaning the revenue and their cost is differentiated. There's three attributes that uh, I like to call out uh, first one is, um, it's actually created within the organization. So the way right now around data products is really not about buying a system, but not buying a CRM, or buying an ERP system and installing it, or buying an external data access through Dun & Bradstreet or Axiom. It's really about taking your own data and building it into your own data ecosystem. That's one. The other, the other part is, um, continuously enhancing it, where you take the raw data and you start developing different parts inside the organization that have different levels of intelligence on data, in time, every time, for the application that they need. And the last part is, uh, it basically has to be able to scale. Now, this is, not, this is not talking about just big data. So big data is yesterday's data. Tomorrow's data is really about applying all different kinds of data, meshing them together to be able to create a data value chain that you can actually use inside applications, inside business, uh, to penetrate new markets, to basically develop new products. So that's our definition of what we're seeing as data product. So, there's four parts to a data product. Uh, the first part is having a rich data repository. Now, rich is relative. Uh, you could basically pretty much download a subset of customers on your laptop 
uh, run uh, GLM on it and do something with it, and that could be your rich data. But the richness actually has a grading factor for organizations as they get wider in data sets and they get deeper in data sets. So having domain rich data is really, really important. And that's why you um, look at companies that are actually bringing different departmental data actually together to create a synthesized view of the enterprise. So the enterprise view is no longer an organizational chart or a geographic chart. It's actually how the data sits inside an organization really defines what that organization is all about. A managed compute environment um, where everything can be deployed. Now this is really talking to the overall DevOps part of management and that's becoming very important because as there is a lot of data moving around, it's not just a end organization like the IT organization or uh, you know the data scientists or the business users that are responsible for shepherding the data. Uh, everybody wants to have their own way of working with the data, uh, its own value, its own data gravity so that they can put it in a different area. So having different managed environments for different purposes is also a part of the anatomy of a data product. That models, that's what we're all about. Um, in terms of being able to derive the value, it's no longer about creating veneers of rules or veneers of access or veneers of extracts around the data. It's really being able to get dynamic with the models and change the context on the fly as you need it. That's really what is required inside a data product. And in reality, if you're missing one of these attributes, um, you probably are going to have some format of a data product. You just won't have a product that is going to last for very long. You're going to have to go in and change certain layers of attributes and enhance it. The last part is uh, very important, which is the user interface. And the user interface is really a byproduct of design thinking. It's not really a plain interface where you're having a UI or web UI interact. It's really for a persona, for a business user, for the end user, could be a data scientist, could be a shop floor worker. If you are putting out a result, what does it mean to them in that context, at that part of the process step, and how are they going to use it? That is the most important thing in the output. How you got to the output using how much of data, that really is not pertinent to them. And if you can not bring it close to the user and close to the usage, it really is not going to be sticky and they'll actually move on to the next application. So what does it all look like in an overall ecosystem? So this is a functional reference architecture, right? It's not an architecture. It really does have underneath it uh, building blocks that you can start to build upon. So the bookends on this represent things that actually transcend the layers. So you have to have the bookends at every layer. So you need to have quality of service, privacy, security at every layer. Inside of this, um, there is this is intentionally a stacked architecture like this that allows you then to build on certain capabilities that are defined inside these boxes. And the way to use a reference architecture like this is not to try and beat it up for how do I start to develop against it? How do I start deploying against it? Um, which part do you actually look for a product against, even if it's open source? The way to use these kind of reference architectures is really to start looking at a common language that's going to be used across different usage types and different departments and different people inside the ecosystem. So this defines a starting point analytics architecture that can be used at the enterprise. Now, a few call-outs in this is if you look at the data ingestion to the data analysis and aggregation layers, there are different facets. And inside of this, um, there is a, another detailed architecture we can share at a later time. Uh, it really blows up into about six to 10 functional capabilities inside each one of these areas is how it actually starts to grow in. If you look at security, identity management itself, basically has, um, you know, like single sign-on um, will be a part. And you have to kind of implement that across the stack. So this is a capability map that should allow you to start thinking about a data product. At the bottom, you basically have the data at rest, data at storage, or data in motion. 
and how do you actually take it. So imagine a data product when you're done would be a slice across all these layers at the top. So now, as, you, as Kim will talk today, you know, we're going to talk about uh, you know, how and, and how many ways can you use these building blocks to uh, deliver uh, applications out in the real world. So there's actually the design patterns that you have inside um, are inside of those layers that you just saw. If you go across those layers, you'll find technology patterns. If you go on the uh, vertical axes where you're actually trying to deliver data products, you'll find design patterns for data products because you'll actually start cutting across certain capabilities in a specific fashion. For example, if you have a recommendation engine like uh, Netflix, everybody's familiar, familiar with, uh, it would basically cut across and the UI would look like the next best. What would you have? And that is actually now cutting across all the layers that we just showed. But if you're developing something with uh, machine learning and you're using H2O, then inside of that layer, you're trying to basically formulate a pattern where you say, for X type of problems that I have, if I basically have classification for kind of problems, what are the algos that I can have ready made by data type that I can have in my repository, then apply them. And that will basically go on a horizontal basis. So the only thing that we'd like to kind of, as a takeaway on a top-down basis, before I basically start getting into demos, I know everybody likes to see code and demos, is remember that the data product needs to basically go and have a top-down and a bottom-up validation. The top-down validation goes as follows. You basically start with a business goal in mind. If it's done, if it's done right, what is the value? For example, when you get all those mailers of credit cards in the mail, uh, you pretty much you know, think it's, it's a wastage. For them, a 2% hit represents about $100 million. So there is a business goal towards doing that kind of offering. It's really not random because they have a lot of data that they collect before they actually send it off. Using solution components. Uh, so think in terms of sets as you're looking at different technologies, you're looking at different capabilities. Think about sets. Start with uh, a reference architecture in mind. Build out the building blocks. Those are your solution components. Then you basically go in and look at the combination of components and reference architectures before you actually go into the technology. Now, what this allows you to do if you basically do a top-down validation is that it allows you to answer the question at any time, so what? And it also allows you to answer, but if we don't do it then? Those two questions are really important for data products. If you don't have that, pretty much it could become a science experiment and your funding stream could be lost pretty quickly because it's really not relevant for your organization. The most important consideration here is that every time I see enterprise class projects uh, spin up, especially now uh, with data products, is I find that everybody wants to kind of get the, the whole stack built out to the best of their capability. So you basically have the front end in terms of um, you know, data collection, now you have a Kafka layer in, in the middle, and you're putting that somewhere for you know, storage and then moving it onwards. So you have a store and forward mechanism that you've built out. And everybody's trying to go for the top tier resilience, the top tier of storage, the best and the brightest. Consider timing. You always have to build what you're trying to do in a good enough fashion. There is a good enough factor in building out most of your ecosystems. So this applies to most of the apps, um, other kinds of data products, other kinds of intelligent systems that you've built in the past. There is a good enough factor that you should apply and stage it out because if you're trying to move this to a point where everything has to work to five nines availability and be able to handle a petabyte a second every time, then you're probably going to have a pretty long project uh, with a pretty large price tag and not enough results to show for it. So what are, the, what are some of the patterns that you can basically take away? You can, you can take these patterns and, and try and adopt them. Um, I'll basically be showing a couple and then Ludi's going to come up next and actually show you an app uh, 
uh, on AWS Lambda that basically uh, uses uh, uh, clustering and uh, some, something else. I want to see about Thunder. She'll, she'll talk about that. But you can define it into transforming, learning, and predictive. And inside of this, uh, you know, I left the definitions out because I didn't want to bore you with that. I'll show you one that basically um, is, uh, you know, it's, it's more of a, uh, a learning uh, example. So let's switch to the demo. And uh, you folks should recognize this. So this is a, this is an application that uh, you know is um, I just actually built it this this afternoon. I didn't build it yet, but I built it on the laptop this afternoon. So it's uh, this is my rich data set that is going to tell me whether or not um, I qualify. And if I qualify, what kind of interest, interest rate could I get on this credit card? So a very simple way to play with this is I basically change my annual income to inner bucks, and I am declined. So in the back, this is not running just JavaScript. It's actually going to the model, going back into the data, looking at what I, what I am. And it's basically then giving me a decision in the back end. So this is an example of a data product with a very in context application that can be used in the flow of decision making for credit apps. And pretty simply, as I basically move that up, and if I make some more money, and if I make some more money, well, stop at 12 million, but they want to make, make some money off of me. So uh, it takes that, and there's a lot of considerations. I won't flip through this. Um, as Sri said, this is available. Uh, we'll make the links available to you as well. You can download it, build it, play with it. Uh, actually, in the background, you can check out the source and see uh, what it does. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Ludo, who's going to walk you through a deployment in AWS. Um, I'll take any questions on this section. What about payments missed? The, uh, that, uh, the individual has missed payments or something? Oh, could you add those? You actually yeah, could. I mean, you could basically, I'm sure you could actually add those delinquencies. Let's see what that does to me. It increases. Let's see when it actually gets me out of it. And they still want to basically have it. Wow. We got to fix this model here. Anyways, it basically should have kicked out from a semantic reason to kick me out by now 100 billion percent is quite, quite high. So anyways, this is, you know, uh, maybe you'll actually take it out, fork it, and put it back for us and, and, and fix that. All right. What is the model? So this is GBM. That's, that's behind this. What is GBM? How many of you know GBM? Who's it's a boosting method uh, that is used. So basically, the easiest way to think about it is it's basically trees upon trees, it's fork upon forks, that are then collected together to make a collective decision. All right. Hello, my name is Ludi. 
I'm an engineer here at H2O, and today I'm going to be talking about how to build a machine learning application um, with AWS Lambda. So, first question is, what is AWS Lambda? So, it's a compute service that runs your code um, on demand in response to events. And the nice thing about it is that it lets you forget about all the DevOps tasks that you normally have to think about. So, if you run your code on Lambda, what you don't have to worry about is server and operating system maintenance, capacity, provisioning your servers, scaling, um, code monitoring, logging, and um, other tasks that traditionally DevOps do. So we can think of Lambda as just as this tool that lets you run serverless code. So it takes a lot of the headache away out of scaling your application. So if you want to use AWS Lambda um, with a data problem, what you do, these are the seven steps. So the first step is just identify your problem. Um, once you've done that, you do the data science part, which is to train the model on your data. So you build this model. So now you have the model that you want to scale. Using H2O, you can export it as a POJO, which is a plain old Java object. And then step four is you write Lambda code. Um, so this lets you build the deployment package to Lambda that you upload to Lambda. And that's step five. <coughs> And then finally, step six, you map an API endpoint to the Lambda function so that you can call it. And step seven is that you embed that endpoint in the application. So basically, if I boil this down, what you're doing is you're building your, your model and you're putting it on Lambda so it scales and you don't have to worry too much about it. And then you're using this API endpoint, which lets you call that model. And you can hit it as many times as you like. Um, According to AWS Lambda documentation, uh, there's no limit to the load, the load that it can handle. So now I'll walk through a concrete use case, which is domain name classification. Um, so there are certain domains that are considered malicious, and they earn their label because they engage in all sorts of malicious activity, like spamming, botnet, phishing, and so forth. And so what we want to do is block these um, from getting to your website. So our problem, which is step one, is how do I identify malicious domains from legitimate ones? And you'll see I have a table with a few examples of legitimate domains and a few examples of malicious domains. And so now I'm going to throw out a question to the audience and just feel free to shout out the answer. What are some features we can build or use to distinguish legitimate from malicious domains? Sorry? Um, well, just based on the domain name. Entropy. Entropy, length, correct. Length, digits of numbers. Length, digits, numbers, great. Anything else? No spaces. Spaces, what else? In dictionary. If they're in the dictionary, great. So these are all great features. Um, the ones I settled on are string length. We, see, we decided that malicious domains tend to be longer and legitimate ones are smaller. And that bears out in the examples that I have. We have entropy, which is a measure of the uncertainty. Um, so basically, if you have many similar characters, or if characters in a string are repeated, your entropy is lower. And if they're not repeated, your entropy is higher. Um, number of substrings that are English words. So if you look at the domain, and you look at the words in the domain, if they're actually English words, we're going to say that this is not a malicious domain, and the opposite, and vice versa. And then the proportion of vowels in the string. So if you have more vowels, you tend to not be a malicious domain. So my data source, um, are all, it's all publicly available. It's just a list of domains and whether or not they're malicious. So it's a labeled data set. And then since I did have a feature which required me knowing whether substrings are English words or not, I needed a reference text of English words, a dictionary are these words in the English dictionary. And so those are their sizes. So I built a logistic regression model, and that's a GLM of the binomial family. I used ridge regression for regularization. Um, and this is the confusion matrix, so you can see how well it does. And I had a holdout data set, so my validation data set is how I used to test the accuracy of my model, which is different from the data that I trained on, so it's training and validation data sets. And so you can see here, it does pretty well. The false positive rate 
which is the number or the rate of domains that my model classified as malicious but actually weren't, is 1.9%. And the false negative rate is domains that actually were malicious, but my model said that they were legitimate. So it does pretty well, but you know, with more features or more tuning, you could probably do better. But I stuck to four features for now. And so now I'll get back to the app. So what is the workflow for this app? You want to visit the web page, you input the domain name, you get your prediction, and then it tells you, is it legitimate or is it malicious? A pretty simple workflow. And now I will show you the app. So this is running on AWS Lambda as we speak. Here's the app. We predict if a domain name is malicious. So it finds that this domain name, please don't hack me, thanks, K okay, thanks, bye, is malicious. And you can see um, I broke it down for each of the components uh, and the total log odds. So if this number is positive, it identifies the domain name as malicious, and if it's negative, it's considered legitimate. And I can just you know type in anything and you'll see. Please don't hack me, Kate thinks is still malicious, but please don't hack me is legitimate. So this is a working sample, and if anyone wants me to try any domain, I'm happy to. Um, so and we can see that as we get shorter, we see that the lead score decreases, which is why it pushes it towards the legitimate um, classification. H2O.ai. <laughs> Legitimate. <laughs> so actually, it's a, yes. H H two two O O. H two two O O. Still legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Going back to your previous screen, um, you mentioned that uh, you use rich regression. Yes. Um, what was the? How did you arrive to that conclusion that rich is the best? Uh, so I didn't. It's just a good practice in general. It has uh, the effect of shrinking your coefficients to avoid overfitting. Um, so let me just extend that to um, how did you make that distinction between, say, ridge and offset? Um, I just just chose. I didn't uh, do any grid search or hyperparameter search. I just did based on my previous knowledge. Ridge regression usually works well. I'll do it this time. I didn't do a thorough search. And a possible improvement could be um, you know, testing the lambda, the difference of lambdas, to do ridge regression, lasso, or something in between, like elastic net. There aren't very many features here, so the sparsity induced by lasso is going to matter less. That's a great point. Yeah, with four features, you don't need those yeah. features. Yeah. I was going to say, I was going to say, who you would say? Okay, so now um, we're gonna look at a little bit about the architecture, what's really going on in the back end behind the scenes. And so it starts with the user inputting the domain name, like you saw me do, and then it goes through a JavaScript <laughs> app, and it makes an HTTPS post request to this dotted region, all of which is encompassed in Lambda. And it hits the REST endpoint. And it goes to a Lambda function handler, which every Lambda application has to have. And then I actually do something a little special, which is Jython feature Monday. So you notice my input is actually just the domain name. It's not the features that the models use, like the string length, the entropy, the proportion of values, and the number of substrings in, that are English words. So I have to do extra work, which is the feature munging, converting these names into numbers that the models can use. And then finally, I just call a tool model, the POJO, to make the prediction. And so I will, you can actually go in depth. I've just copied the Lambda portion below so that you can have a reference for where we are in the back end. So this is a sample of the Lambda function handler. And it has a response class, a request class, a context. And it calls the predict function, which is Jython code. So we'll step over to the Jython feature bundling. We're in now the third step in the back end. 
And you can see that this is actually Python code, but what it is, it's Dragon, so it compiles the Python code into Java bytecode and then runs it on the JVM. So it's a nice way of easing the burden on the coder because it's much, Python's much less verbose while still being able to use your Java classes and your Pojo. And then it calls, so we go from here, you see malicious domain models, the Pojo, and it, the Pojo itself has these coefficients which were trained um, in step one when we trained the model. So these are the coefficients of our logistic regression model. So that's been on the back end. Now I should say that everything I've just done, you can do. It's all available on a GitHub repo. You can clone it, there's the link. All the slides are also available online. Um, so you just follow the steps. Step two has a lot of screenshots because you're using the AWS Lambda interface as a GUI to uh, configure your function. And then step three you actually saw me do when I started the, the Lambda, the, the front end. Um, so there are some troubleshooting that you can do. In the interest of time, I'll skip over it. Um, so some caveats. Lambda, your function has to be stateless because part of its ability to scale and scale to in, in parallel with the number of incoming requests is that it is stateless. So it just spits up new instances of your function um, with new containers. Um, the other thing I discovered while working with Lambda is that it has certain cold start behavior. So the very first time you run your Lambda function in Java, it initializes your container and it takes about 40 seconds. So that means you think your app isn't working the first time you run it, but it actually is, it's just starting up. So be aware if you're doing performance testing, there's this cold start behavior. Um, and once after you, you invoke it the second time, it's all fine, the container's up, it's reused. And that's not something that they do a good job of documenting, so it might come as a surprise. And then finally, if you're using the API gateway as your REST endpoint, um, it has a timeout of 10 seconds, so your function, your total compute time, has to be less than that, or your function's gonna time out. For configuring your Lambda function, you basically can only set two things. You can set your memory and your timeout. And with your memory, the Lambda microenvironment will allocate proportional CPU, network bandwidth, and disk I.O. Um, they did this because it's just an easy single dial solution. And if you want to tune, you can check your logs to see how much memory you actually used compared to how much you have allocated. And then you can set a timeout. Um, these are some resource limits. Let's go through. So here are the pricing. It's a very generous pricing plan. In the app that I just showed you, after the first, after the free tier, it would cost a dollar an hour to run. So you can imagine the cost of that compared to a DevOps team and the cost of hardware and so forth. So this is really a democratization of scaling. It ran some performance tests. Um, you see that as we make more threads, the error percent error increases. So if you're building an app that needs, you know, 100% non-error, that's something you should take into consideration. So lambda scaling, as I also referred to earlier, um, there's <coughs> no limit to the number of requests your code can handle. And it just starts as many instances as are needed and scales to support the rate of incoming requests. So here are other examples of how to use POJOs in other environments besides Lambda. You can do the Java Surveillance Container, you can do it on Stormbolt, which actually will be shown to you tonight by Spencer. Um, or maybe streaming, I think he is doing that. One of those. Um, so there are other examples for using POJOs. Um, here are resources on the web. And thank you. Do you have any questions? Yes. Yeah, so after you train the model and you put it on AWS, mm -hmm. uh, can and how do you then use the data it's fitting on on the online process uh, to update certain coefficients over time and so see what the error rate is like online and so forth? We don't actually update the model once it's been uploaded to Lambda. It's uploaded as a POJO, it's a plain old Java object. So that stays as it is. Right, but is, is, there, is there a non-automatic way to then uh, <coughs> 
you know, get out the statistics of how it's operated online? Is there a way to then like download that data again to retrain your model on a periodic basis or something, even if it's not done automatically? Well, the only thing you can get out of Lambda is a JSON. So we're using the Rs endpoint. So the Lambda function is stateless. So you could do something per request See, you would have to have some knowledge of whether the uh, label was accurate. Okay. Or what's the, yeah, that's true. So, if it's an incoming request. Well, let me ask you this way, like is there logging, like the instances that it t fits on uh, Yeah. It is online. So potentially, for example, you could download the data later and get some of those observations at your own expense or something mm -hmm. to periodically read them. Okay. Yes, but it's not automatic because the Pojo once it's up there, it's not going to change unless you upload a new function. But that actually reminds me of something else is that the nice thing about Lambda is you can hot swap the model in. So there's no downtime. If you want to change your POJO, you can re-upload it, and there's no like downtime. Any other questions? Yes? I just wanted to hear your perspective on the cost. Um, it's the dollar an hour, just the cost. For a machine that's being sold for one and a half cent per hour, so how do you? Uh, AWS offers that half gig machine for one and a half or two cents per hour. Oh, so, so are you comparing you, EC2 with yeah. Lambda? Is that your yeah, comparison? Yeah, so I just want to hear your perspective on at what point you find Lambda uh, financially. Like um, well, if your only alternative is to buy the hardware and to employ DevOps team. That's going to be much more expensive than a dollar an hour. Do you right. So, so I've actually. Do you have, in, from your experience, do you have some like uh, some number where Lambda becomes oh. more expensive? When, when is Lambda worth it? Is your question? Yeah. Yeah, I actually don't know. It would depend. Um, if you have just a microservice that you don't want to worry about managing the servers or provisioning the servers, I would say that Lambda is, what I've seen is so generous and their price is so low, I would just do it. Any other questions? Come back. To what? Sure, because I haven't cracked open the Lambda infrastructure. I, you know, I don't work for Amazon, but um, I just guess that it has to do with simul how many threads are simultaneously hitting it. So I'm going to guess, and Tom can can chime in if I'm wrong. Is that in the first row, it's just it's in sequence, right? It's sequential, so it waits for the first call and then it goes to the next one. In the second and third rows it's doing 10 or 100 simultaneously. So it's maybe a little bit more difficult for Lambda to handle concurrent executions. That's my guess. And I think you were, you were driving all of these from a single like laptop client. So you might see different behavior if you had multiple clients. Like they're, they might even decide that it's doing like a mini denial of service or something, right? Because it's one client that's driving all of the load. Um, so if you had many clients, it might be a different. Yeah, there might be some throttling going on. Yes? What sort of security is around um, the Lambda service? Or in, uh, and um, I guess any logging or any data that, or in your model that might be stored in this, this particular instance? Yeah, so there's CloudWatch logs. I can actually show it. Uh, yeah. yeah, all this is uh, on, online, uh, Lambda documentation. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy to show you where the logging is done. So you can see I've just tested my own function through the console. And I get some logging here. And then I can click here to go to the CloudWatch log group. 
and I'll see all my logs. It'll tell me how much I've built for my duration. And if you click around, you'll be able to find um, actually what it returned as well. And as for security, that's something you configure when you set up the Lambda function. I set it to open so that uh, I could enable this demo, that anyone could use it and try it. Um, but there are other layers of security as well as, uh, if you're familiar with Amazon, the IM uh, feature, you can set different policies and roles. So there are layers of security that you can tune. All right. I guess we'll go on to our next speakers. Who are Welcome. So my name is Ashwath, uh, and I'm the um, security data scientist out here at H2O. Um, what we're going to be presenting is two different use cases. Actually, uh, one use case which is new, and the other use case which Luri just presented, but as to how that has been implemented in a production environment. And um, what you will see is the aspect of how you can make an application out of it. Um, you know, how, uh, for example, in, secu in, the, in the field of security, you need people to, to get real-time feeds to get information so that they can act upon. Um, so what we have actually done is we have two presentations, which will show you um, how you can identify, I wouldn't say anomalies at this point in time, because we ourselves are not issue with the data. So um, something that um, you know, would help people in the um, security SOC operations. So the first one, um, so what we were looking at here was, um, we were trying to identify what would what we could classify as anomalous logins in terms of Windows machines? So, we um, for, for our data set we had about nine million logins, and out of that we were trying to figure out specifically how the service logins actually happen. So, service logins in this case is you know when machines log into each other, or machines log in as um, shared resource um, for printer access, for um, shared folders, and um, AD access, and those kind of things. Um, so that is what our focus was, because that's an easier problem to tackle in the, uh, at the behest of it. So which is why we looked at it first. So we saw there were about 4 million logins, uh, and we started off by first classifying them using time and different kind of features that I just showed you. So the first thing that we did is... Showing you guys the wrong slide. Okay, so the first thing. You guys can see it clearly? Okay. So the first thing that we did is we actually looked at the, the set of logins across um, the time of day. As you can see, um, these logins um, are spread across between 9 to 5. Now you would wonder, most of the service access, most of the batch process usually runs in the night. Why would you be seeing activities you know, between 9 to 5? And we'll actually answer that later in the slide. But this is something that, you know, uh, at the start of it, it actually becomes interesting. So the next thing that we actually did is, we had a set of domains that we had, uh, which we wanted to break this data down by. So we actually broke it down by you know, different kinds of domains. 
So wherever you see you know, account domain one and two, we've actually scrubbed the data just, you know, just to make sure that we're not, pro we're not putting out any kind of information that's not supposed to be put out. Um, so the first one is actually um, an, um, an account domain that exists across a corporate network. So which is why you see the largest amount of activity out there. The NT authority you know, is your system, uh, system domain that actually works through. And then we have following which there are multiple other domains which show little activity. Um, the next thing that we did is we actually looked at the same thing by different types of logins. Now Windows has um, about 11, 11, different, 11 to 12 different types of logins that exist. And what we saw was the maximum number of activities was from something as, you know, with network resources. So this is, um, this tells us that, you know, there was a lot of um, printer, shared resource access, shared folder access. If you go back to the first slide, we saw something interesting here. We didn't see much activity between 5 p.m. and 9 a.m., which is usually when service activities actually happen. Now, this is surprising, right? But when you go back to this slide, that is where the answer comes from. So most of the activities are actually happening around the time when people are logged in, primarily because the largest number of activity is occupied by you know, using resources on the systems, and which is why you see more activity in, uh, in the daytime than in the nighttime. We continued um, this exploration using different kinds of authentication packages. You see that Kerberos is largely used, which is, you know, as we know, is decently, it's, it's pretty secure. Um, there are a lot of access, which is done through NTLM, which is not necessarily safe, but it looks like there are a lot of legacy systems that exist. Um, we also see Microsoft Negotiate. So for people who are not familiar with Negotiate, Negotiate is basically a framework that allows you to step up, step down, based on what kind of packages you actually have on your system. Um, and then you see you know, Microsoft authentication packages and something that actually works well. So the activities down there is actually pretty less. So the Kerberos actually associates itself very well with the corporate domain network. So in total, we looked at six different, six different kinds of features. Um, we looked at the account domains, we looked at the authentication packages, the key lens, the logon process, the logon types, and the different kinds of internal volumes. Um, what you see below them are all the different variables or the different options that we actually have for them. Um, so the next thing what we wanted to do was we wanted to cluster this data. Now, one of the reasons we, we wanted to cluster this data was we didn't have any labeling. We didn't, we didn't have any information to say, oh, this logon process was actually malicious. You know, someone actually broke in through this and we actually lost some data. We, we did not have that kind of information. So we had to go completely blind, so we completely went unsupervised and we started off with clustering as, as a starting process. So all of the, the combinations of features that we have uh, put us close to about 40,000 combinations. But it's kind of difficult to look at 40,000 different combinations to see you know, where an attack has happened because it's, the attack has to be one, but your normal activity has to be in a million. And that is where the problem is. So you literally have to reduce your space in your exploratory, the space that you're exploring, and which is why we actually chose um, PCA in this case, just just to make sure that you know we don't we don't go about looking for every option. What we did is we took all those features and then um, we clustered the data. What you see here is how our data actually got clustered. Um, the first cluster that we actually have is a Kerberos use cluster. So as I explained earlier, we saw maximum number of activities in terms of Kerberos um, and in, in, in the corporate domain. So that actually formed a very strong cluster. Now the idea here is whichever um, feature actually forms, uh, whichever feature is actually very strong, tends to form its own, uh, uh, tends to form a cluster very near to it. So that's that's how the approach, uh, the approach is. Um, the next thing that we looked at was we, we actually found a server login cluster. So this is where you know servers generally log in. Um, servers actually communicate with each other. This is not necessarily batch process. This is um, how servers actually talk to each other. And, you know, for example, you know, a database server talking to an app server, or IAS talking to um, another server. Those kind of activities is what we saw here. Um, the batch process. This is where you know you you see the activities that are very similar to cron jobs, and that form you know we actually were able to identify its own cluster. 
then um, one of the most interesting things uh, for someone you know who works in the field of security is NTLM. NTLM is always interesting because um, it's just you know it's it's, it's always there, it's kind of insecure, so it's, it's good to look at it. Um, we actually saw two different kinds of clusters in NTLM. Um, actually, uh, a binary cluster, but you know separated. And the reason why we actually saw that is based on the different versions of NTLM that was used. So one, which is basically NTLM. Uh, the one on the top is actually an NTLM version 2. The one at the bottom is actually an NTLM version 1. So we saw that there is a lot more activity happening with NTLM version 1, which tells us pretty evidently that you know things are insecure in that zone. Um, further on, we ended up finding some amount of logins, which are not necessarily classifiable as service logins. What we believe the, this is is you know when um, administrators log into servers, Using um, KVMs, um, using you know remote logins, um, you know they would have a session running and they'll just RDP into it, and those kind of sessions were something that we actually identified by this. So, um, in total, um, this is actually an uh, unsupervised approach that we tried um, for trying to figure out you know how we can differentiate between something that's normal in terms of logging and something that we can identify as maybe malicious. <laughs> Maybe uh, anomalous yeah, in login activities. I mean, this is an ongoing work. Uh, the idea is, you know, how you can present that kind of a work with a front end. And the what we have here is well, what we actually have in production is a backend which actually you know, provides this as a real time feed um, for um, people in the SOC, which is basically security and operations center, so that they can understand the data better in near real life. Um, any questions on this? Yeah. Have you tried to uh, see what the behaviors are for individuals who uh, like have failed logging attempts? Uh, that's a very good question. So, but the problem here is that we were just working with the login data. We have not looked at correlational data, where you know you've seen multiples. So, uh, I one of the things that I could look at is look at a sequence of bad logins. And then see you know one good login, and then I see oh a shared folder is accessed. I clearly know what that is, and you probably know what that is as well. So we we did look at that kind of act. We have not done correlation yet across our data. That is something that we are going to do in the next step, uh, primarily because we want to see how the login looks like. Um, some of that. Yeah. What is the source of data that you get it? Um, I'm, I'm so uh, so it's basically one of a, a customer we work. Some, some random data. Um, any other people? Well, so what was the size of this company? I mean, I, I missed the first like maybe few minutes. I actually didn't mention the size, but anyway, I mean, um, it's um, it's actually a large corporation. Large corporation. So they're using. A yeah. Unsupervised data. Is that correct? Yeah. Right? Yes. You good? Um, so. One of the uh, quick things that I actually wanted to show you, and this is something that, um, sorry for my screen size. <coughs> so, um, what we're trying to show you is the fact that you, know, you can have, um, you can actually crunch all your results using H2O, you know, um, and then um, in this case, you could be using like a SQLite database just to um, put the data out in the front, and you could have a front-end app which actually works in real time. And this is one of the implementations that um, you know one of our customers has, um, just so that they can get this information real time. So this is just a very, very basic uh, approach that we're actually doing. Um, I'll actually pro pass the mic to Avni. She's going to speak about the second use case, which is very similar to what um, we spoke about, but how we have implemented that in production. Um, can I have a question? Sure. So it's, it's related to a question that uh, uh, this person mentioned in the previous uh, call. How do you update your models? So once you have set up a model and then you deploy it, how do you maintain this model's current with new data that is coming? So the mechanism so, so right now we actually have um, 
we are actually building a process where we can do model management. Mm -hmm. um, you'll probably see it, you know, um, sometime soon. Well, right, but currently we're doing the whole process manually. When we update the model, we're actually doing it manually. So after all those analysis, can you build a model so that uh, see the correlation of those six parameters to figure out that this one is? Uh, yes. The, but the approach is going to be that um, we actually have to go a lot more in depth with that data. This is, um, you know, unsupervised, very superficial right now. It's just to see where things stand. It's not necessarily, oh, I exactly know that was a that was a break in. No, we're not at that point at all. We just. But, but that's your goal. That's the goal. Yes. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Ahmi, and I'm going to talk about the second use case here. really similar to what Ludi talked about, um, where we're identifying domain names as either normal or machine generated. So again, we have a list of normal domains and generated domains. Um, and again, we're classifying which ones are going to be normal and machine generated. And we chose these four um, features, which some of you I heard throughout earlier. So our first feature is the frequency of a given letter. Um, our next one is the percent of coverage. And what that means is, um, we look at forward combinations of characters and see which match some hits in the dictionary. So um, things like face and stack will show up in the dictionary, whereas combinations in the generated domains most likely will not. Um, our next feature is entropy of characters, which we used uh, Shannon's entropy algorithm to calculate the entropy for each of the given domains. Um, and what you would hope to see is that uh, normal domains have lower entropy than machine-generated domains. And lastly, we have domain length. And again, you see that normal domains generally have uh, shorter lengths than generated domains. So what we did here is we took almost a million generated domains and <coughs> not generated, a million registered domains and a little over 50,000 uh, machine-generated domains. And we initially classified all of them as normal domains. So at the bottom, you can see true negative and true positive rates, and uh, false negative and false positive rates. And what we're going to do is add each feature in and see how that improves or decreases the accuracy of our model. So after adding alphanumeric frequencies, we see that there's an, a jump in um, accuracy of, of about 3.8%. With domain length, we see that there's a little bit of a decrease. Um, and a thing to note there is it doesn't always, adding more features doesn't always result in a more accurate model. So we see here that our model actually got worse with um, adding in another feature. Entropy of characters increases our accuracy a little bit, 0.4%. Uh, and lastly, percentage of coverage increases our accuracy about 0.6%. Um, Last thing to note here is, although you see a 99.37% accurate model, um, that's not great, just because if you have something like 10 million data points, um, you're still letting in almost 60,000 <coughs> bad machine-generated data points. So uh, always looking for a more accurate model. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions about that? Yes. So I'm quite sort of curious how you So the way we actually looked at it in this case is we actually looked at the uh, the count of characters for the length for the domain of the, the length of the word, and then we use that as a rate. So we, we basically use a ratio, and we calculate the ratio for the entire all, all characters in a domain name. Ratio of all the characters in a domain. Ratio of the count of a character for in a domain name. Okay. As uh, as so it's it's basically um, p log minus p log x. So for p, um, so we modified that algorithm. We modified that to be minus p log, uh, actually minus x log x. So and my question is, how are you calculating the p as in the probability? That, that's basically the ratio, the, the count of the character in a domain name to the total length of the domain name. Okay. 
So for example, in Google, G would be like two thirds. Oh, okay. So you're not exactly, um, entropy is not like over the absolute universe. No, no, no. I, yeah, one of the re yeah, one of the reasons we wanted to do it relatively is because, for example, H2O.AI itself, it, you know, would for, would not be in the in the usual location, you know, where you would expect it to be. So, so, so that has H H H H two, so that has like lesser entropy. Yes. Than H two O. Okay. Yeah. I get it. So little little characters are given. Yeah. Okay. And and this was related to the domain. Uh, we we had to make sure that we are actually working uh, within the data set that we had because uh, the moment we go alpha, um, you know, alphabetical, then you are going into a completely different zone. You know, it, it's more language based it's not necessarily domain based yeah. and we actually had the same problem of what if we go to like let's say we start supporting UTF-8 other languages as well then we are going to a whole different space so we actually had to narrow it down to just domains as our analysis okay. so. have you tried the uh, domain that Google recently purchased uh, A to Z alphabet Oh, actually, no, I'm, I'm just curious oh, because okay. uh, you know, talking about entropy, I, I think, I think that, that would be an interesting use case for us to check. Yeah. So, so you're saying uh, the newer uh, domain generation algorithms actually use Twitter as its source for generating domains? Is that? So, 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 so,
activities is like like this video, I like this music, I like this artist, I dislike this artist, or I uh, like this song, and all these uh, activities are sent to the backend. And then these clients, these it can be iPhone, it can be Android, it, uh, it can be also like the Fed application or your on your desktop. They are uh, asking for recommendation, so the user can see the list of the music videos, and they are asking for recommendation from I call it REBB, which is the recommendation engine black box. And the client's asking, give me the next 10 recommendations, give me the next 20 recommendations. <coughs> and this black box should provide the recommendation based on the observation of the activities of the actual user and of the set of users. And the goal was just to build recommendation engine which will provide these recommendations. And that was really, uh, that was really, uh, really tiny. Uh, time uh, schedule, so we have only one weekend to prepare some basic prototype for testing, and based on the testing, there was like uh, some evolution phase. So we really we were in big hurry, and there was uh, also a lot of requirements on this recommendation. So there are a lot of users, really a lot of users, a lot of activities coming to the backend. So it has to be scalable. So you know we cannot we cannot like say, okay, give me one minute to process this activity. We have to really uh, process them uh, quickly. Then also, we have to serve the recommendation, uh, recommendation back. And there was a really hard time <coughs> limit. It was, it's 500 milliseconds, but still, you know, like for, if you, if you would like to do some uh, hardcore computation, 500 milliseconds for the round trip time is really short time. And then there was also uh, another requirement the solution should be deployed in Amazon infrastructure. And also, as I mentioned, it has to be ready in two days, or some basic solution in two days. So this is, uh, this is the just summary of the requirements. And so what we decided, we really do quick brainstorming and say, okay, we will just try something really uh, quick to prototype and we'll see how it will scale. And so we took like, uh, variation of the lambda architecture, which means that processing some the, some uh, events and uh, storing the events to the, some offline storage and and uh, processing the online uh, events and giving some uh, recommendations back. And there was a crucial requirement: we were not sure what we will do at machine learning side. Really, we are not sure with respecting all these like. Uh, time requirements. If we will have time to process data in H2, if we will have time to process data in Python. So we decided to design the architecture to be really tailored for experimentation. Really like prototyping the solution, prototyping the algorithms at the back end, and playing with different kinds of the recommendation algorithms. So this is like an uh, uh, overview of full architecture, and I will. Uh, go step by step through each layer. So there is some uh, front end, which is just receiving the, AP, uh, the activities, the uh, activities of clients. Then there is some storage layer, uh, some back end. I call it like batch processing machine learning back end. And there is full architecture deployed in EC2 machines. We use bare EC2 machine. We didn't use any lambdas or any like, uh, you know, provided services from EC2. The reason was that we didn't want to spend time to like uh, learning these services or uh, learning uh, uh, you know, different new technologies. And also, uh, there's some experience with uh, EC2 and handling them and building the infrastructure of, of top, on top of EC2. So we wanted to use our experience. So at the front end, we just plug simple, we call it API router. The API router just receive events from the clients. And there was one requirement which I uh, forget to mention. The, uh, the clients will access the REST API. The original proposal was to use the Amazon Kinesis, which is the streaming technology delivering the events about acti activities, but then 
the requirement was were modified and uh, it was modified to use the REST API. So we just exposed the REST API and we used the ACA framework spray, which you can scale. You just define the actor which is reacting to different uh, endpoints, to different REST API endpoints, and just sending the messages to the rest of the infrastructure. And uh, we also plug their HA proxy, which is just technical, technical trick just to uh, scale the infrastructure and make uh, modification of infrastructure uh, during the you know, runtime. So this API router handles user activities. So that means that if there is activity like click, swipe, dislike, we just receive the activity and we do in fact a really small computation, really tiny computation, which doesn't hurt a time performance, but we forward, we save the activity to the Redis, which is our storage back, uh, storage solution. And there is a beauty of that, that. The beauty of that solution is that we don't need to like do any fancy computation. Also, Redis provides some simple, uh, simple functions or simple uh, parameters how to let's say order the list. So let's say you can easily keep a list of top ten artists or top ten like uh, most uh, liked artists or most top ten most disliked artists. Uh, it's really easy to use and it's really easy to scale. Then we also receive at uh, this uh, API, uh, API router, we also receive the events or requests, give me the next 20 or 100 recommendations. So in this case, we, ne we, uh, we are not doing any computation as well. We just going to the Redis and looking is there, compute, uh, is there a recommendation for this user already prepared? If it is there in Redis, then we just serve that back to the client. If it is not there, then we try to do the best effort how to figure out what is the uh, recommendation for the actual user. So we do a lot of clever, tri cl clever tricks. So we prepare some recommendation list of the, based on the pre-computed user activities. So we do uh, we did a little bit clustering in this root, router, which was very simple. It was just big table and just uh, take the cluster for the user based on uh, recorded activities, and then we just figure out the cluster and we set the recommendation from the cluster plus some heuristics. And those all really simple and powerful solution. Then. Behind uh, uh, this API, API router, we plug uh, Redis, which was the, our storage solution. And as I mentioned, it was a really, uh, good decision because it scales. But I was surprised. It was my first experience with the Redis. And I was surprised how well it scales, how well it behaves with respect uh, to the memory footprint and also CPU footprint. And it also support a uh, really simple model of persistence. So if one of the race instances crash, they can be uh, rebooted and they will, uh, they, will, they will reconstruct the state from uh, some uh, logs. So it was perfect solution for this situation. And what we, how we use the Redis? We use the Redis as event bus. So when we receive the activity from the user, they publish the event in the Redis. The shape of the event was something like there was activity, click, and the user ID. And then there was at the back end, at machinery back end, there were a lot of, lot of listeners listening to these activities and computing, computing different statistics about uh, the users. Then we used the Redis also as data storage. So we store there also uh, history for each user, how many clicks. Uh, how many likes, dislikes, and we also use, as I mentioned, the Redis to uh, like help us to manage the statistics. So for each user, let's say we, uh, we um, manage the list of top 10 likes, top 10 swipes, and top 10 artists, and a lot of like, really small art, uh, statistics which uh, are helping to machine learning backend to figure out the right recommendation. 
and yeah, there's, there was a storage layer. And at the end, we plug their machinery back in. That was a crucial part, and we really were not sure what to put there at the beginning. We, did, we didn't know like, what will scale, what is the best solution for this domain. So we just designed it in the way that there are a lot of, we call it runners, and the runners are processes which are just going to the Redis, listening to the events, looking at the statistics about the users, about the user activities, and computing additional statistics, which are expensive to compute, but they are separated processes, so they can be offloaded to different machines, this can be scaled up, you can have a lot of these runners running. And we try a lot of solutions. We try to plug their Python, we uh, try to plug their H2, we try to plug their H2 with Python, we try to plug that Spark with H2, and a lot of solutions. And the best solution was combination of, of all of them. Really, like, we, at the end, we figured out that the, uh, the best recommendation engines, engine for this situation is one which will use all the information and combine all the power of all the tools which we <coughs> use. I'm going to just skip. And this is, the, in fact, the final strategy which we, uh, which we deploy. So when we, there was a reco uh, request for recommendation, which was sent to the Redis, so there was even give me the uh, prepared recommendation for this user. So then there was one runner, which was H2 process, H2 on top of GBM, running its scores, its, uh, its scores, uh, the user and assign with the user the target target cluster and the cluster was something like uh, let's say music style but I say I'm saying that it's music style because we had a lot of clusters based on the kind of the user which was like this user like the pop music but he's a little bit like uh, he he likes a lot of yeah, exploring a lot of new styles so based on this clustering then we selected the algorithms which produce the final recommendation. And the algorithms were designed for each cluster. But then we figured out that there are really specific users which, are, which, are, uh, which have really special demands. So we figured out that we need to have, we need to track these users. So it's kind of the outlier in the data set. And if we figure out this user, if we detect this, user in the data, in the in incoming activities, we have to trigger some alarm at the back end, receive email and say, okay, this is really interesting user, he, he likes or she likes different style of music, adopt your recommendation algorithm. And surprisingly, this scales pretty well. So at the end, the results, we, uh, we plug it to some uh, in fact, to do some production engine, and we were evaluated based on the real data, on the click rate, how, how long the user is active uh, with the application, and there was like technical peaks, like we, uh, the, the activity speed was 50 activities per second, average, or, uh, average was 10 activities per second. We didn't have any like major downtime, Downtime during the run of the of the application because of HA proxy at the, at the front of the application, and uh, we were like the second best recommendation engine in the in the in fact in in I think there was like another six uh, let's say companies or teams competing with us. It was really surprising because we built that. It took like uh, one weekend, plus some tuning, three days, and then observing what's uh, behaving in the in the system, what's behaving in the, with the users, and adapting the algorithms. So that was our experience. Really, it's really easy to build recommendation system with current tools, with current infrastructure. It's easy to deploy, and it needs ad hoc algorithms, which serve well to the user. So that's all for, uh, from me.
thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, I'm here. Yes. Um, which is your build during the weekend? Which is pre-made already? So we uh, during the weekend we build a uh, whole infrastructure and the basic uh, recommendation engine at the back end. So basic, uh, let's say, usage of machine learning algorithms. So we use combination of HTML, we combine them with the, uh, Python tools, and that's all. So the machine learning part is already made, right? Yeah, but you know, you have to still decide how, how, to, how to combine them. Uh, you only have 50 activities per second, so uh, given the fact that actually, you know, if you have, you know, more users, you have to kind of rapid, if you have to rap rapidly scale, um, then, you know, what kind of queuing does, uh, you know, do you actually plan to use or in the future, or does the Redis, Redis uh, you know, have actually any type of queuing? Uh, yeah, so, uh, like, uh, the idea before was just that we will plug it behind the kinesis and keep uh, like you in the kinesis and then we'll just scale the Redis layer and machine learning layer. But we, what I did, I did a really small test on my machine and I was able to scale this simple architecture with like single uh, front end, single back end machine up to like 150. 50 events per second. It was like, it was not big machines and it was pretty hard. There was another question. How do you measure the error metric? Uh, is it like when you swipe to the next song because it's into that song that feels like an error or in the kind of song? Yeah, there was like measure cell metrics and I think the driving metrics was how uh, how long we keep the user active? So how long we entertainment entertain uh, the user? So it was like a lot of pressure how to provide like good recommendations. Don't repeat the recommendation. Don't you know? Don't uh, sometimes uh, the user accidentally dislike uh, the song. So let's try it a little bit. Uh, put the designs back and you know verify that it was an accidental accidental design, and we figure out that for most of the users, it scales pretty well. This like it's single time recommendation, so we just prepare a lot of lot of like recommendations for single user, and then uh, for the cluster of users, and then we just it slightly adapt them based on the actual user. And you know there are of course like artists like uh, which are quite popular and which are like which you can use for any 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 user. Okay. Thank you. So today we saw a lot of um, stories about data products, architectures of data products. Obviously there's a lot of um, stuff ahead, right? you kind of get simple. How many of you actually have um, built a data product before? Anyone has tried? Which was that? Um, I I come from an enterprise company, basically, so we can, build. Can you speak loudly? So um, um, I'm working in an enterprise software company, so we build. 
Yes, yeah, so some of the problems with data products, right, sort of, um, we'll talk about them briefly. I want to kind of be, uh, thank you for coming. Um, I think what, what you really are looking at, and I'll just go very fast on some of these slides, is really data products are, um, for the first time, data, analytics, and apps are coming together to one place, right? The convergence of data products, data, analytics, and apps together are smart applications. Right? Historically, analytics was offline. So now it's coming together in a streaming way in a single place. So there's some unique problems for data products that don't exist with, for traditional data-driven applications. Data-driven applications are applications that are just taking a database at the back end, presenting data uh, in beautiful ways, right? Now you're going from there to actually analyzing and learning the logic from the data. So you actually, instead of rule-based applications, you're building pattern recognition-based applications. The unique problems with that is that the data um, dependencies for some of these, I mean, is that it's actually going to be very, um, that, you know, some of you know this very well, that software is eating the world, right? And, and which means that all our jobs are going to be eaten by software very soon. Especially, um, especially if you're um, a vertical company, you're very likely looking at ways to build, um, go horizontal, right? What does that mean, really? So if you're, if you're in a software company or an insurance company today, you're really um, focused on how do I build a community and defend a community? And that's kind of the core theme behind data products. Vertical is a new horizontal, right? And why, is, why data products? And we saw a few products today. Um, people you may know, so you, you know LinkedIn made people you may know, right? So that's one, one of the first big poster child examples for data products was the people you may know problem, right? Where because you have data, you now you can reuse it in, in beautiful ways that can thrill your community. That's why you need data products, right? You're using this, the data you collected, whether it's weather data to predict it could rain two days from now, or whether you're using it to predict that you'll buy more on, on, a, on a less rainy day. Those are all real products that are side effects of having data, not just presenting data. And I think the companies of the future are the ones that are gonna build large data ecosystems much like Google, plus huge 59 degrees of the world, right? Um, or, um, or Amazon, which we, we purchase most of our stuff through Amazon. So if tomorrow Amazon comes and tells, we have audited your product, your whole, your whole company better, we'll trust them more than someone like an auditor who comes along and says, I'll sample your data, you look good, right? So you kind of have this big data version of products where you run all the data through you, you, without sampling. That's where you get some new values out of your data. I think that's kind of a, the theme behind today's talks where basically post big data, what's going to happen? You're using your data to produce new value. I think that's the one slide if you really have to take away is one big slide, is what we're doing as companies, both here and in my customer base, is either building communities and defending those communities with better products. And, the, and, and you saw some of that today, the D3 edition of it. You're trying to build real love from the community with beautiful products, right? So you want to thrill them. I mean, that's kind of the, the, so you saw D3, the first, the backbone of the Lambda architecture to deploy it at scale. But really, the, the real story that goes to the boards of the world, or the people who make choices, is visualization. So it's a combination of both intelligence and beauty that you want to give to your customer. And that's what a beautiful data product really stands for. Right? And you want to spark joy as well. So if you're building a consumer app, think about how do you really build some really cool stuff. So what are we doing here at H2O? We're trying to take AI to business. And that's actually a pretty tall order. AI has been popular several times in the last 20 years and has been popular several times in the last 100 years, of course. And some say it'll be the only thing popular in another 100 years, right? It could be the only thing left in 100 years. Only if really we succeed today, right? So kind of, we want to try to bring that transformation. In that transformation, we, I don't want to talk too much about H2O itself. The community is a massive growing community. 
We have about 1,100 customers of our companies of using it every day, right? Sort of 5,000 of whom have basically went on to like really deploy it at scale. Okay. So, but then the, there's a bunch of stuff that we do. I'm going to jump through here. But really, where we really want to focus our community is to make software. Right? How do you make a part of software? And software is transformative, as we have all known, right? And some of you build software today in closed source. Some of you work in software as maybe product managers or builders of product or, or consumers of product. I think participating in something that's bigger, which is open, this kind of gives you the thrill. Some of these folks who joined us were all open source. They came from the community, much like you. And they participated in that. And that changes. Being part of machine learning um, is actually quite interesting. <coughs> and this is actually true because the Silicon Valley of this company right here. This is one part that's actually quite interesting. As you saw today, you saw the domain knowledge. Um, Ashut was playing domain knowledge, right? And he was also collecting data from, from customers. Customers gave us data. And there was an algorithm that he applied for the TGA, but really it wasn't true until you saw a design. Like the visualization gave you the design. But the application and the back end of the application is what Ludi presented. I think this is kind of the, the multi-dimensional part of data products. And you need to kind of bring all the different dimensions. And somehow, if you found a business guy, you could sell it to a customer. So I think that's the real uh, thrill about this new space, is the space is, rift, is ridden with multiculturalism at the core. You've got to have one of each kind before you can build and deliver a true data product. And I think that's, uh, this will be the story of part two, part three, and part four of this story is the data products are going to really demand that we work together with different uh, people. Um, of course, I'll jump through here. The key piece is that, I mean, how many of you have read this book? It's a pretty interesting book. Think fast and think slow. I actually call it like scoring versus learning, right? You're training, and when you're thinking slow, when you're thinking fast, you're just reacting to the model you already have. Right? Um, the first part is, of course, you, you encapsulate rules, right? But you want to go from rule-based applications to more le learning-based applications. And I think that's the big aha difference between traditional products and this product. Where you want to go away from large applications. And that's what we're seeing at several of our customers as well, is you want to go from just giant monolithic apps to simple app stores, right? Same, think of decomposing apps into app stores. So decomposing a security app, which is sitting running on a router today, to lots of little services that you can then reuse and re recompose to what you want. And this is what you're going to see as kind of the future of software products. There's one other good slide in this big deck. I would say this one is interesting. It's all on SlideShare, by the way. We'll put all the slides on SlideShare. Someone asked, they'll be available on the Meetup link. But I think what's happening is data dependencies. By bringing data into the application logic, we have basically short-circuited what used to be a database element into the application element. So we coupled it instead of decoupling it. What that means is your column, let's say discount column changes somewhere upstream, your model goes haywire much later. Right? So uh, I call it the usual tweaks. You have models today being built offline, going online in six month time frame. Right? But you've compressed that to almost seconds time frame. So now when a model for whether to send you to ICU or not is just using a gradient boosting method, someone talked about GBM today, fires, that model was approved by a governance, a data governance somewhere in there, a model governance, that goes before that it was actually built, deployed, and, and, and the prediction, all of that happened. So one column change somewhere can trigger the entire chain of reactions to go haywire. So debugging this data dependencies are very hard, much harder than core dependencies. And we actually do not have tools for some of these. ML pipelines are also quickly, they become your, the, 
If you think about machine learning as the networking of today, like networking 95 caused all this jungle of network wires, some of you remember those days. ML is going to be in just the same situation with our tools. So one of the things we're doing now is actually try to build some of, the, some of these tools. Someone asked for logging, and, and someone else said, why do I need logging? Well, that's probably the only hope, the trace log, right, sort of. And a trace log and retrace log, how do I trace it all the way back? Where did the model change? And how do you manage models? How do you unit test models itself is a theoretically unsolved problem in some of these places, right? Sort of, how do you test a model? Well, if you think about model as an intelligent being, a small intelligent element that you plugged into your application, you need to tra train it and, and make sure it's right using a bunch of rules around it, right? So if you think about a, a car, a driverless car, it follows a bunch of rules on the street, right? So, so you now kind of have some method for it <coughs> to follow the rules. But sometimes these rules are, not, are also prone, error prone. So that's kind of where applying models to manage models is something that's coming off of new, um, new interest, new theoretical interest as well. So managing models, and then the world is changing very fast. So a model, did the model go haywire or did the world change fast? Some data breach in a different customer has led your credit card company to change all its models. That has impact on its own. So it's a lot of interesting new tools that need to be built. A second big piece of this revolution is we need interpretation. We need people who, who can understand what's going on. Someone asked the question, why did we pick ridge regression, right? Simply put, it's actually easy to understand, right? So what about deep learning? Well, you have several layers. How do you break that down? So all these interpretation and how do you really put make sense of the math and tell a story. And that becomes the next territory for us. And so between these two slides is where we have put a bunch of engineering effort now to build tools to consume AI, to consume machine learning. And I think this is kind of where we are really looking for new people to come in, join us, and build a whole slew of tools, a slew, a slew of really good um, engineering um, uh, practices, Right, the design patterns is a good idea there. What I want, we want to build an AI DB or the equivalent of database features for AI where a column change can go trigger a model change. Right? How do you create triggers? How do you create constraints? <coughs> How do you interpret them? What are the change? All of this stuff needs a lot of good visualization as well as database. As well as AI IDE, I call them the AI, AI DE. You need to bring the IDE, the integrated development environment for building smart applications. And these are the kind of things that we're focused on these days. And we're definitely looking for people who can come and help us. And this is kind of the uh, smart application stores that you want to see happen. Because people are consuming software as apps, not as big applications that you see in, in big um, in PCs. Right? So I think this is the kind of the, the revolution that's happening for just software itself. And as software engineers, I feel it was interesting to see not many hands go up when they said GLM or GBM. It's, it's, a, it's a good thing, right? More software engineers are moving to machine learning or using machine learning and want to learn more about machine learning. Finally, this, it being a team sport, it's really very hard to incentivize team sport, right? If you think about um, putting together a meetup, why, why should someone put together a meetup? It's a community, it's team sport. We're bringing all of us together. It's, is that incentivized? Is it gonna lead to customers? Is it gonna lead to that, lead to this? I think as a whole, the society is not used to um, like recognizing people who bring others together, right? Through a party, well, it's good. But what happened as a result is the question they asked. Same way, trying to bring team sport together, you're incentivized today as, well, rock stars are more recognized today. That's why we think that we can brew great talent, not just acquire great talent. So we are here to build great talent, and building a team sport driven, a data driven based culture is going to be a very hard one for the entire industry. And I think this is a great, fantastic way to, because score takes care of itself. So another interesting uh, road ahead for the world is where app stores used to be able to go to cloud 
now you have app stores um, which have ML in them. And we, I mean, this is a, another kind of classic big data slide where data by itself is not interesting. You want to consume data through applications in the cloud. So I think, and, and what you saw earlier is, an, is a cloud example of how Lambda architectures can plug in machine learning for you and then now power new applications. It's actually giving a reason to rebuild applications. That's the big difference between what we're seeing today with machine learning versus what we saw with big data a couple of years ago, is that there was no reason to rebuild applications. There was a reason to rebuild data stores. But now what you're seeing now is a big change shift towards that. I think um, we learn a lot from our community. We learn every, every day we learn a lot from our community. And the importance of, we moved into a big space. We used to be in a really small house, but right? some of you have visited us there. Um, we moved into this space mostly because we could host meetups, right? And so we learned a lot from the community. And I think what we are continuing to do and will continue to do more is get more of the community's feedback and give you GitHubs where you can start participating in. I think that's something that we are really pushing towards. So definitely talk to Tom, talk to Ashrit, talk to Ludi um, on GitHub, right? And fork the project and start adding pieces because that's, I think, what we are really seeing as the big difference between participation. So most of our um, our goal now is to build an ecosystem of smart applications. An application building an application shouldn't take a long time. It should be a weekend, as someone had in their slide, right? So. So spend, we're going to do a few data hackathons, code hackathons, data product hackathons. So it becomes far more real, far more like play with it as opposed to theory, right? So this part two of this, we want to do it again, what, roughly three weeks from now. So we can have you guys come back and play with the product, play with data products, build them, and scale them. I think we're really thankful for having you guys here for this long. Thank you for spending time with us. I think um, bring back and go online, make comments, make, improve, the, improve the meetup series. Because I think the data product series is going to run for another couple of years. And that's the one we want to join. Thank you so much. Thank you.